I hope that's working. Um, good, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me at the back? Fine, okay. Um, well, it's a, uh, an honor and pleasure to be here this evening. Uh, um, with just to who I am, I'm Tim Congdon. Um, do various things, but I'm economic spokesman for the UK Independence Party. So when in 2015 UKIP uh, wins the election by general election by a landslide, <laughs> Nigel Farage will be in number 10 Downing Street and I'll be in number 11. Um, and um, I'm an economist, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm going to start not as ordinary models with, with, with a joke, I'm going to start with a statement and then a question. Now, um, we live in a nation called the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. And my question is, do we in this house uh, want that to continue for us while we're alive and for our children, grandchildren, and so on? And um, you may think that this is a somewhat over-the-top question to place. After all, we have a a British Army, a Royal Air Force, a Royal Navy, we have a Queen, we have a Whitehall, permanent secretaries, etc., etc. Surely we're a nation. Well, I'm now going to quote you that was said by Angela Merkel about a year ago. Ironically, she was about to see David Cameron to persuade him to uh, support her in keeping the European Union on tracks, but what she told the European Parliament, this is a quote, of course, of course, the European Commission will that one day become a government, the European Council a second chamber, and the European Parliament will have more powers. But for now, we have to focus on the Euro and give people a little more time to come along. Um, and that is the planned fate for our country by the German Chancellor. She intends us to become part of a federal Europe. And again, if you think I'm being a bit hysterical about this, uh, there are people in the Liberal Democrat Party, there's a chap called Andrew Duff, who just a few days ago said that he thinks that next year, Liberal Democrats should come out openly in favor of Britain belonging to the United States of Europe. Perfectly straightforward. And he said, um, that, um, you know, um, we're coming up to a crunch time and we must campaign for the federal Europe which we espouse. Now, you might think that Nick Clegg would slap this chap down, but he hasn't done so. It is the plan of the Liberal Democrats to make sure that Britain is integrated into a federal Europe so that the United Kingdom becomes a state, the United States of Europe, in just the same way that uh, I could be a bit mean and refer to North Dakota, but Britain might be kind of like New York or, I don't know, Illinois um, in the United States of America, except that it's actually part of the uh, United States of Europe. Now, um, that is, I'm not making this up, all right? These are statements from prominent politicians there in public, there's no secret about them. These people want to end the independence in existence of our country. Why do I want Britain to continue to survive? I think I've got, and I've only got two or three minutes to get this over. I think I'd make three points, really. One point is that we are a special country. In the 20th century, we didn't have a knock on the door in the middle of the night. You know, we're not, we're not like Germany and Eastern Europe and France. You know, France had the humiliation of the 1940s and so on. All these countries are involved in European integration ultimately for historical reasons because they want to suppress the identity of their nation. And we don't. Uh, and can I just to get this clear? There is at the moment proposals, Winston Churchill said in 1946, at the Iron Curtain speech in Fulton, America, that habeas corpus and trial by jury were bulwarks for freedom. Both those things are currently under threat from the European Union trying to introduce their justice system into my country, and I'm afraid Parliament is giving way. The second reason is that we have basically an honest government. If and buts. I know there's MP expenses scandal. And the rest of Europe, they laughed at us because we had these MPs taking a few thousand pounds of their expenses. Their politicians do far worse things than that. 
And by the way, in this document, uh, there is a section in there about pan-European political parties where the European Parliament, in the recession of the last five years, has increased the expenditure on these ridiculous pan-European political parties by 200% to about 35 million euros of taxpayers' money all being spent on binos and the rest of it, trips and the rest of it for these MEPs. And the third reason, maybe in practice the most important argument in public debate, is that we're worse off because we're in the European Union. We're worse off simply partly because we, spend, we send some money there. We pay, the, pay the about 1% of GDP each year, which are relatively rich in the European context. We also, really, this is the really critical point, our businesses, particularly our small businesses, are subject to a whole raft of directives and regulations, 150,000 pages, all this stuff now, that actually reduce uh, our um, GDP. In this piece of work, I've estimated that the directives and regulations that come out from the European, come out from the European Commission, it's not really a democratically elected organization, it's the European Commission ultimately pushes them, um, that these uh, cost our country about 5% of GDP. On top of that, we have the costs of the common agricultural policy, protectionism, I make the total cost over 10% of GDP. And people say, this is an incredible figure. It's going to grow. I can say that very confidently because the European Union is a declining share of world output. A declining share of world output now for 20 years or so is declining because there's too much government, too much regulation, too much inefficiency. Ladies and gentlemen, we must leave the European Union. We want our country to be a country in the 21st century. We cannot stay in the European Union. We must leave. Thank you very much. Thank you. Around late July in 2012, a senior banker was photographed leaving Downing Street. And now that's an unremarkable fact. But what is remarkable is that the planets aligned and the photograph that was taken was of such high quality that you can read the type of the document he was carrying. And the type of that document was, what would be the worst thing for the UK financial industry? And there was one bullet point beneath it, and it said, the UK leaving the EU. Now, Tim Congdon has said in previous speeches, not, not tonight, but in other speeches that I've seen, that the economics of the situation is 90% of the debate. Now, if that's the case, then why are so many groups of businesses, groups in the banking industry, 10% of Britain's GDP, all saying that they want to remain in the EU, all saying that it is vital to their continued existence and their continued proliferation that they remain in the EU? Why is it that they champion the benefits of having access to a single market if the economics is just so clearly bad for them? I mean, I think the answer is probably that it's not the case, right? Um, in my speech, I'm going to talk about two main things. First, I'm going to talk about what being in the EU is like and what the effects are and why they're either good or don't get better when we leave. And then secondly, I'm going to talk about what the alternatives are, what the alternate, alternate conceptions of the United Kingdom could be and why they're not better either. Um, but first, maybe just some stuff on the speech we just heard. So for the majority of the speech, we heard all about how Britain is a special country and how... Like, it took us a long time to hear any real reasons about why the UK actually is worse off in the EU. But we did get some, we did get some. So, I mean, first, first of all, we had stuff about MEP expenses and a problematic culture that exists within the EU. I mean, this is probably an argument to just make the EU better and maybe get rid of MEP expenses and probably doesn't really fly well in the face of leaving the EU entirely in protest of those things. But furthermore, we did talk about regulations, and this is probably an important point, right? So he said, you know, like, businesses suffer massively under the crushing weight of regulations. And I'm going to talk about more of this in my main speech. But I mean, there is a reason for regulations, right? And they're not just there for no reason. If regulations just are just bad for all businesses, it's confusing as to why the EU would implement regulations at all. And the reason those regulations are probably implemented is to give uniform access to that market, right? So that when you want to transfer products to all the member states that are in the EU. You don't need to create you know, 15 or 20 or so variants so as to comply with all the individual regulatory like frameworks of those nations, right? You just make one variant, and that's cheaper to businesses. So we say that. I'll be talking about that more, more in my main speech. But then he also said the EU is declining. And I mean, again, like, 
the UK leaving the EU would probably be bad for the UK. I'm going to talk more why that's the case in a minute. But we think, I think we should probably also talk what the effects on the EU would be. And the effects on the EU would probably be pretty bad, right? When we take away, for example, the massive financial industry that's at the heart of the City of London, and in terms of the lines of credit and financing that the UK can provide to those nations, the fact that 26% of non-EU companies put their headquarters in the UK as a point of access to that single market, right? At the point at which we're not a member of the EU, the, the UK door to companies of European parent arms, though those are gonna, they're going to find it much, much harder to secure investment, given that it's no longer that point of access, right? But on to my main speech. I mean, there are plenty of effects. And I mean, first of all, there's the cost of membership, which is, you know, one of several, you know, p potentially negative impacts of being a member of the EU. We say, first of all, the cost of membership is not like a transformative sum of money. And while they're large numbers, with com like comparatively struck against the other kinds of sums of money the countries regularly deal with, we don't think it's that much. And we also think that we get like meaningful benefits in response, right? But secondly, we think those things do some really good things. For example, EU structural funds go quite some way to helping development in like post-Soviet bloc countries. And they've been found to be particularly effective in terms of developing like poor education or poor standards of governance. And it means that they become markets for UK products. I'm going to talk about regulation in terms of the reasons why that's good in terms of selling your product, products to such a huge market and how uniformity in those areas is a good thing. But also, we think like regulations from EU are actually like considerably better than regulations we have in Britain, given that they actually have teeth. So if you look at the effects on like airline charges, the, the impacts on Microsoft, the impacts on like, like mobile phone roaming charges, these are all like meaningfully like good things that we've had as a result of those bodies operating from Brussels. Secondly, like some other things, and this is about the reasons why the British public tend to want out because we don't think it's an economic debate, economic debate on the ground. We think on the ground it's actually about politics, it's about sovereignty and it's about you know benefits and healthcare and British jobs for British workers. But we think these are disingenuous like problems to have with the EU, right? I mean first of all if we're British workers are losing jobs to EU workers, I mean, that's probably the case because like, like non-British workers are going to accept the worst working conditions and those companies can bid for the, like, the lowest standards of the workforce. I mean, maybe you could just regulate those working conditions so that those things don't happen. But furthermore, in terms of benefits and welfare, like a report by UCL found that immigrants are like 45% likely to use benefits than British people are. And I mean, even if you account for discrepancies in age and gender, that figure only falls about 21%. Um, and then if you look at the amount of tax they, they like, give, immigrants are likely to give 34% more tax to the exchequer than they take out, right? Immigrants give like a massive net contribution, and we don't think this is a massive problem, and we all benefit. This is what we're paying for, right? All these benefits. And we say, like, furthermore, you get all of these issues at FDI and about the, what the alternatives and what an alternate world would look like for the UK. So we think if you look at, like, the CBI, the Confederation of British Industry, who are talking about how, like, neither a Norwegian nor a Swiss model of, like, part integration with the EU was really feasible, right? Because if you look at Norway, who are a member of the EEA, they get access to the market, but they get specific exemptions for things like fisheries or oil. But the point is those exemptions, first of all, have to be agreed by other member states. And secondly, they have no influence and have to follow rules and pay bills that are dictated to them, right? So they, they don't have the sovereignty and they don't, they don't escape ruling from Brussels, right? And say, furthermore, if you look at like the Swiss, they, have, they like, manage a bespoke relationship where they have like 120 agreements that they have to negotiate and they're getting a bit to the end of the tether on, terms, on, the, on that sort of front. And again, they have like little influence and in practice, they just have to implement all the laws anyway in order to preserve their access to the single market. So we think we're really going to have to hear about what would actually change for the UK, why things would be better, and what alternate reality we'd be in, right? Is it going to be something like a Swiss model, a Norwegian model, or are we just going to cut ourselves off from the EU entirely and try and access these other emerging markets, which is probably unlikely given that they're forming their own trade blocks anyway and are more likely to engage with the EU as another trade block rather than a tiny itty-bitty island that's on the side, right? So for all those reasons, clearly oppose the motion. Um, I would dispute a lot of them about, specifically about the trade and uh, talking about companies relocating to the United Kingdom just so that they have access to the single market. The point is here, the UK has some competitive advantages that are global and not regional. These advantages include finance, but they also include technology and indeed education. And we are in a globalised system and we need to be able to act globally 
and be able to orientate these systems to be as competitive as possible. Indeed, we actually sell 50 times more to the rest of the world now than we do to the European Union. Indeed, if you take out the EU, if you take out the UK trade internally, we sell 85% more to the rest of the world than the UK, sorry, than the EU. The point here is that we are a global nation and we have global friends. At the moment, the European Union is in crisis. We have anemic growth. We have high youth unemployment levels. Indeed, over five and a half million people across the European Union, young people, are unemployed. 50% in Spain and Italy, 60% in Greece. The reason, the underlying reason for all of this is that a one-size-fits-all model of regulation does not fit at all. And in the UK, we have one in five young people being unemployed. And the statistics are only getting worse. If you look at the spectrum of growth across the EU, the turbocharged economy that's often referred to, Germany. That's growing at 0.5% this year, 07 next. The UK is beating Germany at its own game, and it's meant to be the powerhouse of the EU. But instead, Germany sets the rules for European Union nations. Indeed, coinciding with many other countries, they gang up on the, the perspective of the UK for a more free trading and freer system when it comes to finance, when it comes to technology, and yes, indeed, when it comes to education. But what was posed there is what's the alternative? Now, as a Swiss citizen, I uh, take umbrage with the fact of talking about Switzerland and saying that we're becoming at the end of the tether. Seven out of ten Swiss citizens want to remain outside the EU because they see the benefits. 3% unemployment over double the average income per year. And that's not just Switzerland. We're looking at our, we're looking at our cousins, we're looking at our allies around the world, whether it be in America or whether it be in Australia. Australia have not had a recession in over 20 years. They doubled the average income in the UK. They have lower youth unemployment. And why? Because they are free to change their system, to change their economy, to change their processes, to adapt, and to effectively create jobs, prosperity, and opportunities for young and old. Now, the reality, well, the reality is that the UK is the largest consumer of Eurozone and EU goods if you take into account goods, transfers, income, and services. That was in 2012, and indeed, we are Germany's largest consumer. And in total, we have a deficit of over 80 billion pounds a year with the European Union. The point is, we have an Anglosphere that's craving for a deal that suits them and the UK. We have a special relationship not with the EU, but with the rest of the world. And fast forward to 2050, we're looking at these trends increasing. We're looking at independent nations across the world increasing their GDP, increasing their global opportunities for their own citizens, because they are free to do so. Whilst, as Tim mentioned, the European Union is a declining bloc seeking regulation at every turn. Indeed, Patrick Minford, Professor Patrick Minford for the Freedom Association estimates that 6%, nearly 90 billion pounds a year is spent on regulation in the European Union. That is a cost we cannot bear. And that's a cost that our allies around the world aren't bearing. They're able to change, they're able to adapt, and they are able to link with each other without any political union, to make the best for their citizens. So, this house would be better off outside the European Union because we have a global relationship. We have competitive advantages in sectors such as finance and technology that go beyond the regulatory power of the European Union. 
And we want to be free to make the deals, like the Swiss have with Canada even a few years ago, five years before the European Union got in its uh, groove and actually finalized one. And the issue here is basically our connectivity. And the issue for you, I would ask, whether you in 2015, in the next couple of generations and beyond, want to be part of a globalized relationship where you're able to go elsewhere and actually have the opportunities that would be provided from the innovative and competitive nature of the globalized economy or to be tied to a declining and quite frankly in chaos European Union with riots, demonstrations, more regulation and less opportunities for you in your future career. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much to our other uh, presenters. Um, from my position, I guess I want to say I didn't want to trot out a large number of statistics about what, we were, what was said. Uh, I disagree with most of the ones that have said there. A lot of those were, you know, let's say statistics. This, what was it? Statistics, lies, and statistics. The key implication I want to get, what was it again? I can't remember. Lies, statistics, and I ah, can't remember. So, all right, the uh, key implication I want to get, so for example, we had Australia trotted out as this fantastic economy. Strangely enough, Australia is a resource-based economy that's been feeding the Chinese boom for some time. It'd be lovely if the UK could relocate itself next to China. Hey, no problem, we can jump that. The other thing would be, uh, obviously we've got uh, other aspects here, the Swiss and the different elements that are going around there. Um, uh, the key thing that I thought on that last presentation was, um, boy, the, all the types of relationships we could have around the globe. What a lovely thing. It'll be like the internet. We'll just connect everybody. Come on, this is, you know, uh, you know, what are we talking about here? Took 50 years for the European Union to even begin to get sort of the relationship. Key thing I wanted to get across to you, all of you, I'm at least double most of your ages except for a few of you out there. Um, it's important to try to remember back what it was like, if you will, uh, before you see now where you can jump around, you can hop on a plane, you can go virtually anywhere. Yes, when you enter the Schengen area, you have to sort of show your passport or you, you, know, you have to go through a few more extra things. But fundamentally, the ability to move, the ability to interact, you can constantly go back and forth, you can get a job there. If you break your leg, you have a right to health care there. If you move there and you get married and you move there and you have children, they have a right to schooling there. The ability you have to jump around to different parts of Europe, take advantage of Europe, learn about Europe, study, meet, interact, is astounding and inconceivable. When uh, I was first traveling in Europe in the early 1980s, traveling between different countries, you had to stop at every place, you had to show your passport, you had any type of interaction, changing currencies, Estimates are for every currency change, you're losing about 3% of the value of those. You can imagine how slow, cumbersome, difficult all this was. For me, uh, and this is something you know that I'm used to speaking for 10 weeks, not for seven minutes. For me, there are four real reasons why the European Union is a powerful argument and worth being part of. First and foremost is peace, okay? If you want to look at European history, and you want to look at the 20th century, you ask yourself, which half of that century would you prefer to live in? The first half, two monster world wars, a horrific depression that drew down everything and led to all these nasty, or the second half. The European Union didn't guarantee peace in the second half, not by far, lots of other factors did. But I would argue quite strongly the European Union, its ability to create interaction, to create trust, to create, help to create peace, and I guarantee you, look around the world today, you do not want to live in areas that don't have basic peace. And I would argue the European Union is key to that and maintaining that within Europe. Secondly, the European Union, as I just said, with travel, interaction, is a monster structure for social interaction. The ability for you to contact, to move for them, for others to come here, interact. What's keeping, uh, you know, to be honest, what's keeping the UK higher education sector afloat? It's our uh, international students, uh, including our EU students. So financially, they're a huge advantage. The ability to move, jump, all those opportunities are there, way beyond the ability 
of uh, third countries. You know, you want to travel to the States, well, get your visa. You want to travel other places, you've got to get much more. You want to travel in Europe, hop on a train. So you've got, you know, you have this fundamental piece, you have fundamental uh, social interaction that is not seen. The key implication here, no other international organization has come anywhere near this. It's absolutely astounding in history. Nothing has been seen like this before in terms of bringing the numbers of countries together, the size, the economic impact. So you've got peace, social, political. You have a huge amount of political interaction. Why do I think political interaction is important? Because it enables people to talk, to communicate, to make bargains, to make messy bargains, okay? Rarely are these things lovely, nice, and clean. Ah, oh, we're going to have everybody happy. Why is it that they always talk about fudge in the newspapers and how messy the decision-making process is? Bringing 27 countries together in a reasonable fashion, trying to get them to agree, is difficult. It's slow, it's cumbersome, mistakes are made. No question, of course you can find little bizarre twists to any policy. The sad news is uh, I defy you to go to any large country or any major country and not find those twists and quirks. You want to look at American political policy, oh boy, you know, forget it. It's just as messy, okay? 50 states demanding their rights and demanding their abilities and their distinctive issues. Whew. Okay, so you've got your fundamental peace, you've got your fundamental social, you've got your fundamental political, and then I'd finish up with saying you have your fundamental economic. The growth of economic activity looked at from a longer span, EU starts in 1950. Yes, undoubtedly they're having difficulties with the Eurozone, no question, particularly certain parts of the Eurozone. Germany, of course, has continued on its traditional relatively high-scale trajectory in terms of development. Why was the UK first interested when it did initially the UK when European unions formed? UK says, no, we don't want to be a part of you. We can develop on our own. All of a sudden, all what was much smaller Eurozone or European zone at that time economically outperforms the UK year after year after year. 20 years on, after about 10, the UK says, right, let us in. That time, a nasty guy named Charles de Gaulle, who's uh, president of France, says, no keeps them out. They finally come in in the 1970s. Ironically, it's right at the point when the economy is starting to go poor. Okay? So Britain's always had a choppy relationship. Key implication, though, if you look at the, pat the overall patterns of growth, Britain has done incredibly well over time working through the European Union. Peace, social, political, economic interaction, they're all there. It'd be crazy to leave. Thank you.